technology uh, will come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any time. Uh, good morning and welcome to today's hearing entitled, quote, Bolstering the Government's Cybersecurity Lessons Learned from WannaCry, unquote. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, I want to welcome the witnesses here today. And uh, I would also um, welcome Chairman Smith, Oversight Subcommittee Ranking Member Beyer, Research and Technology Subcommittee Chairman Abraham, Research and Technology Ranking Member Lipinski, members of the subcommittees, our expert witnesses, and members of the audience. Cybersecurity, a concept we hear mentioned frequently, especially in this period of rapidly emerging threats, is an ever-involving concept. Maintaining an effective cybersecurity posture requires constant vigilance as new threats emerge and old ones return. Too often, however, when we hear about the importance of cybersecurity, we are left without concrete steps to take to ensure our systems are best positioned to defend against emerging threats. One of the goals of today's hearing is to learn about real, tangible measures the government can take to ensure its IT security systems are appropriately reinforced to defend against new and emerging threats, including novel and sophisticated ransomware threats. The specific focus of today's hearing will be the recent WannaCry ransom attack, a new type of ransomware infection which affected over one million unique systems last month in a worldwide attack, attack that impacted nearly every country in the world. Although the concept of ransomware is not new, the type of ransomware employed by WannaCry was novel. WannaCry worked by encrypting documents on a computer, instructing victims to pay $300 in Bitcoin in order to regain access to their users' documents. Unlike typical forms of ransomware, however, WannaCry signaled the ushering of a new type of worming. Ransomware, which caused the attack to spread faster and more rapidly with each new infection. In light of the novelty built into WannaCry's method of attack, cybersecurity experts, including those we will hear from today, have expressed significant concerns that WannaCry is only a preview of a more sophisticated ransomware infection that many believe will inevitably be launched by hackers in the near future. Beginning May 12, 2017, the WannaCry ransomware infection moved rapidly across Asia and Europe, eventually hitting the United States. The attack infected 7,000 computers in the first hour, 110,000 distinct IP addresses in two days, and in almost 100 countries, including the UK, Russia, China, Ukraine, and India. Experts now believe WannaCry affected approximately one to two million unique systems worldwide prior to activating the kill switch. In Illinois, my home state, Cook County's IT systems were compromised by WannaCry, reportedly one of the few local governments subject to the attack. Although Cook County has worked to appropriately patch their systems, it is important that we ensure that all vulnerabilities are appropriately remedied in the event of a more sophisticated attack. Fortunately, the hackers responsible for WannaCry mistakenly included a kill switch, which was uncovered by an employee of Cryptos Logic and used to terminate the attack. Cryptos Logic employee exploited a key mistake made by the hackers when he registered the domain, uh, domain connected to the ransomware attack. Experts, experts estimate that the kill switch prevented 10 to 15 million unique worldwide systems, system infections and reinfections. Although based on information available thus far, the federal government systems were fortunately spared by WannaCry. We want to ensure that the government is sufficiently prepared in the likely event of a more sophisticated attack. Additionally, the committee wants to hear what Congress can do to appropriately address this committee, this, I'm sorry, this climate of new and emerging cybersecurity threats. Through the lens of the aftermath of WannaCry, today's witnesses will help shed light on key steps the government should take to ensure its systems are protected. We will 
also hear today about how public-private partnerships are in, an instrumental tool to help bolster the government's cybersecurity posture. Finally, we will learn about how the President's recent cybersecurity order, which makes NIST's cybersecurity framework mandatory on the executive branch, is a significant step toward ensuring the federal government's cybersecurity posture incorporates the most innovative security measures to defend against evolving threats. It is my hope that our discussions here today will highlight areas where improvement is necessary while offering recommendations as we move forward to ensure the federal government is prepared to respond to emerging cybersecurity threats. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished witnesses. I now recognize ranking member, the ranking member of the Oversight Subcommittee, Mr. Beyer, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to thank you and Chairman Comstock for holding this hearing. Cybersecurity should be a chief concern for every government, business, and private citizen. In 2014, the Office of Personnel Management's Information Security Systems and two of the systems used by OPM contractors were breached by state-sponsored hackers, compromising the personal information of millions of Americans. That same year, hackers released the personal information of Sony Picture executives, embarrassing emails between Sony Pictures employees and even copies of then unreleased Sony movies. In 2015, hackers also took control of the power grid in the western Ukraine and shut off power for over 200,000 residents. These three quick examples show the varied and widespread effects of cybersecurity breaches. So we know the cybersecurity breach that was the genesis for this hearing was the WannaCry outbreak. WannaCry ransomware infected at least 300,000 computers worldwide and could have been much worse. So I want to thank CEO Nino, head of Cryptos Logic, for um, being wise enough to find an employee who found that kill switch, unless you did it yourself. Um, and we're very lucky that that was found quickly and fortunate that federal systems were resistant to want to cry. But we know we may not be as lucky the next time. We must continue to strengthen our cybersecurity posture. By the way, in preparing for this, I've learned from our wonderful staff people that I really need to upload our security upgrades every time I get a chance on our personal computers and on our smartphones. The May 11th executive order on strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks seeks to build on the Obama administration's successes in the cybersecurity arena. And I'm happy that the Trump administration, I don't agree with them on every topic, but they've taken this next good step. The executive order calls for a host of actions and a myriad of reports on federal cybersecurity from every government agency. Simultaneously, the Trump administration has been slow to fill newly vacant positions in nearly every government agency. And, and my concern is that these understaffed agencies are gonna have significantly, significant difficulty meeting the dictates of the executive order. And frankly, I'm also concerned that the proposed budget cuts in the original Trump-Mulvaney budget across all agencies will make the task a lot harder to strengthen security of federal information systems. We've got to make sure that the federal government has the resources and staffing to meet the need in this vital area. The executive order also calls for agencies to begin using the NIST framework for cybersecurity efforts. And I'm glad that we have NIST here with us today. They play a very important role in setting cybersecurity standards that can help thwart and impede cyber attacks. You know, NIST is world renowned for its expertise in standards development, and federal agencies will be very well served by using the NIST framework. On a precautionary note, though, I believe some efforts to expand NIST cybersecurity role beyond the current mission and expertise are well intentioned but perhaps misplaced. We recently had a, a debate of HR 1224 here, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework Assessment and Auditing Act of 2017, which gives NIST the auditing authority for all federal civil information systems. Currently, this is the responsibility of the inspector generals at each agency. They have the statutory authority, the experience, the expertise. They respond directly to responsible to Congress. NIST has no such experience or expertise, and I at least remain concerned about this proposal and I'd be interested in any of the expert witnesses' thoughts on NIST's role in cybersecurity and auditing. So I look forward to hearing from all of you today. I especially look forward to hearing from our general, the former federal CISO, about his experience in these positions and thoughts. One final note, Bloomberg reported this week that the Russian meddling in our electoral system was far worse than what's been previously reported. According to the report, hackers attempted to delete or alter voter data, access software designed to be used by poll workers, and at least one instance, access campaign finance database. These efforts didn't need to change individual votes in order to influence the election, and we really should take these sorts of cyber threats very seriously. I think Vice President Cheney called this uh, a war on our democracy. 
So, Mr. Chairman, this committee held more than a half a dozen hearings on cybersecurity issues during the last Congress, including one on protecting the 2016 elections from cyber and voting machine attacks. So given what we know about the hacking and meddling in 2016, I hope that this hearing today will be a precursor to more hearings on how we can better protect our voting systems. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Beyer, for your opening statement. I now recognize the Vice Chair of the Research and Technology Subcommittee, Mr. Abraham, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, over the last few years, we've seen an alarming increase in the number and intensity of our cyber attacks. These attacks by cyber criminals and by unfriendly governments have compromised the personal information of millions of Americans, jeopardized thousands of our businesses and their employees, and threatened interruption of critical public services. The recent WannaCry ransomware attack demonstrates that cyber attacks are continuing to go from bad to worse. The most recent large-scale cyber attack affected more than one to two million systems in more than 190 countries. Nevertheless, it appears that the impact could have been much more catastrophic considering how fast that ransomware spread. And while organizations and individuals within the United States were largely unscathed, <clears throat> due in part to a security researcher identifying a web-based, quote, kill switch, the potential destructiveness of WannaCry warns us to expect similar attacks in the future. Before those attacks happen, we need to make sure that our information systems are very ready. During a research and technology subcommittee hearing earlier this year, a witness reporting, representing the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the GAO, testified, and I quote, over the past several years, GAO has made about 2,500 recommendations to federal agencies to enhance their information security programs and controls. As of February 2017, about 1,000 rec recommendations had not been implemented, unquote. It is clear that the status quo in federal government cybersecurity is a virtual invitation for more cyber attacks. We must take strong steps in order to properly secure our systems and databases before another cyber attack like WannaCry happens and puts our government up for ransom. On March 1st, 2017, this committee approved H.R. 1224, the NIST Cybersecurity <clears throat> Framework Assessment and Auditing Act of 2017 a bill that I introduced as part of my ongoing interest over the state of our nation's cybersecurity. This bill takes concrete steps to help strengthen federal government cybersecurity. The most important steps are encouraging federal agencies to adopt the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, cybersecurity framework, which is used by many private businesses and directly NIST to initiate individual cybersecurity audit audits of priority federal agencies to determine the extent to which each agency is meeting the information security standards developed by the Institute. NIST in-house experts develop government-wide technical standards and guidelines under the Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2014, and NIST experts also develop, through collaboration between government and private sector, the framework for improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity that federal agencies are now required to use pursuant to the President's re recent cybersecurity executive order. I was very pleased to read that language. Considering the growing attempts to infiltrate information, information systems, there is an urgent need to assure Americans that all federal agencies are doing everything they can to protect government networks and sensitive data. The status quo simply is not working. We can't put up with more bureaucratic excuses and delays. NIST cyber expertise is a singular asset. We should take full advantage of that asset, starting with the very important step of annual NIST cyber audits of high priority federal agencies. As cyber attacks and cyber criminals continue to evolve and become more sophisticated, our government cyber defenses must also adapt in order to protect vital public services and shield hundreds of millions of Americans' confidential information. We will hear from our witnesses today about lessons learned from the WannaCry attack and how the government can bolster the security of its systems. We must keep in mind that the next cyber attack is just around the corner and it could have a far 
greater uh, impact than what we have thus far seen. Our federal government, our government systems need to be better protected, and that starts with more accountability, responsibility, and transparency by federal agencies. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing our panel. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Abraham. I now recognize the ranking member of the Research and Technology Subcommittee, my colleague from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman LaHood, and I want to thank you and uh, Vice Chair Abraham for holding this hearing on the cybersecurity and lessons learned from the WannaCry ransom attack last month. The good news is that the U.S. government information systems were not negatively impacted by the WannaCry attack. This was a clear victory for our cyber defenses. However, I believe there are lessons to be learned from successes as well as failures. A combination of factors likely contributed to this success, including getting rid of most of our up outdated Windows operating systems, diligently installing security patches, securing critical IT assets, and maintaining robust network perimeter defenses. As we know, Microsoft sent out a security patch for this vulnerability in March, two months before the WannaCry attack. These and other factors played a role in minimizing damage to U.S. businesses as well. However, WannaCry and its impact on other countries serves as yet another reminder that we must never be complacent in our cybersecurity defenses. The threats are ever-evolving, and our policies must be robust yet flexible enough to allow our defenses to evolve accordingly. The Federal Information Security Modernization Act, or FISMA, laid out key responsibilities for the security of civilian information systems. Under FISMA, DHS and OMB have central roles in development and implementation of policies as well, well as in incident tracking and response. NIST develops and updates security standards and guidelines, both informing and responsive to policies established by OMB. Each agency is responsible for its own FISMA compliance, and each Office of Inspector General is required to audit its own agency's compliance with FISMA on an annual basis. We must continue to support agencies in their efforts to be compliant with FISMA while conducting careful oversight. In 2014, NIST released the Cybersecurity Framework for Critical Infrastructure, which is currently being updated to Framework version 1.1. While it is still too early to evaluate its full impact, it appears the framework is being widely used across industry sectors. Our committee recently reported out a bipartisan bill, H.R. 2105, that was pleased to co-sponsor that would ensure that the cybersecurity framework is easily usable by our nation's small businesses. I hope we can get it to the President's desk quickly. In the meantime, the President's recent cybersecurity executive order directs federal agencies to use the framework to manage their own cybersecurity risk. As we have heard in prior hearings, many experts have called for this step, and I applaud the administration for moving ahead. I join Mr. Beyer in urging the administration to fill the many vacant positions across our agencies that would be responsible for implementing the framework, as well as shepherding the myriad reports required by the executive order. Finally, I'll take this opportunity to express my disappointment in the administration's budget proposal for NIST. The top-line budget cut of 25% was so severe that if it were implemented, NIST would have no choice but to reduce its cybersecurity efforts. This represents the epitome of penny-wise, pound-foolish decision-making. NIST is among the best of the best when it comes to cybersecurity research and standards, and our modest taxpayer investments in their efforts help secure the information systems not just of our federal government, but our entire economy. I trust that my colleagues will join me in ensuring that NIST receives robust funding in the fiscal year 18 budget and doesn't suffer the drastic cut requested by the President. Thank you to the uh, expert witnesses for being here this morning, and I look forward to your testimony. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Uh, at this time, I now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Smith. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your holding this hearing, as well as the Research and Technology Subcommittee Vice Chairman sitting next to me, Ralph Abrahams, holding the hearing as well. In the wake of last month's WannaCry ransomware attack, today's hearing is a necessary part of an important conversation the federal government must have as we look for ways to improve our federal cybersecurity posture. 
While WannaCry failed to compromise federal government systems, it is almost certain the outcome was due in part to a measure of chance. Rather than seeing this outcome as a sign of bulletproof cybersecurity defenses, we must instead increase our vigilance to better identify constantly evolving cybersecurity threats. This is particularly true since many cyber experts predict that we will experience an attack similar to WannaCry that is more sophisticated in nature, carrying with it an even greater possibility of widespread disruption and destruction. Congress should not allow cybersecurity to be ignored across government agencies. I am proud of the work the committee has accomplished to improve the federal government's cybersecurity posture. During the last Congress, the committee conducted investigations into the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Office of Personnel Management, as well as passed key legislation aimed at providing the government with the tools it needs to strengthen its cybersecurity posture. President Trump understands the importance of bolstering our cybersecurity. He signed a recent executive order on cybersecurity, which is a vital step towards ensuring the federal government is positioned to detect, deter, and defend against emerging threats. Included in the President's executive order is a provision mandating that executive branch departments and agencies implement NIST cybersecurity framework. While continuously updating its cybersecurity framework, NIST takes into account innovative cybersecurity measures from its private sector partners. NIST collaborative efforts help to ensure that those entities that follow the framework are aware of the most pertinent, effective, and cutting-edge cybersecurity measures. I strongly believe the President's decision to make NIST framework mandatory for the federal government will serve to strengthen the government's ability to, to defend its systems against advanced cyber threats like with the recent WannaCry ransomware attack. Similarly, the committee's NIST Cybersecurity Framework Assessment and Auditing Act of 2017, sponsored by Representative Abraham, draws on findings from the committee's numerous hearings and investigations related to cybersecurity, which underscored the immediate need for a rigorous approach to protecting U.S. cybersecurity infrastructure and capabilities. Like the President's recent executive order, this legislation promotes federal use of the NIST cybersecurity framework by providing guidance that agencies may use to incorporate the framework into risk mitigation efforts. Additionally, the bill directs NIST to establish a working group with the responsibility of developing key metrics for federal agencies to use. I hope that our discussions here today will highlight distinct areas where cybersecurity improvement is necessary while offering recommendations to ensure cybersecurity objectives stay at the forefront of our national security policy discussions. And with that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chairman Smith. Um, at this time, let me introduce our witnesses here today. Um, our first witness is Mr. Salim Nino, founder and chief executive officer of Cryptos Logic. Uh, Mr. Nino is credited with discovering new solutions for companies such as IBM, Dell, Microsoft, and Avaya. He received his bachelor's degree in computer science from California State University at Long Beach. A Cryptos Logic employee, as we've discussed in the UK, is credited with largely stopping the WannaCry attack. We'll hear more about that during Mr. Nino's testimony today. Our second witness today is Dr. Charles Romine, Director of the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST. Dr. Romine received both his bachelor's degree in mathematics and his PhD in applied mathematics from the University of Virginia. Uh, our third witness, uh, Mr. Tuhill, is a retired Brigadier General in the United States Air Force is currently an adjunct professor of cybersecurity and risk management at Carnegie Mellon University. Previously, he was chosen by President Obama to serve as the nation's chief information security officer. Mr. Tuhill received his bachelor's degree from Penn State University and a master's degree in systems management and information systems from the University of South, I'm sorry, Southern California. And our final witness today is Dr. Hugh Thompson, Chief Technology Officer for Symantec. Uh, Dr. Thompson also serves as an advisory board member for the Anti-Malware Testing Standards Organization and on the editorial board of IEEE, Security and Privacy Magazine. Dr. Thompson received his bachelor's degree um, and master's degree and PhD in applied mathematics from the Florida Institute 
of technology. Um, we're glad you're all here today and look forward to your valuable testimony. I now recognize uh, Dr. Nino for five minutes to pre present his testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman LaHood, Vice Chairman Abraham, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Beyer, and Ranking Member Lipinski. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today at this joint subcommittee hearing. We greatly appreciate your interest in cybersecurity and look forward to sharing our thoughts and perspectives with you and your members. On May 12, 2017, CryptoSogic identified a high velocity, high impact global security threat with the immediate potential to cause an immeasurable amount of damage. While the intent of this threat was unclear and its motives and or origins ambiguous, it was immediately evident that its approach was unusually reckless. This threat has now popularly become known as WannaCry. It was at this time that Marcus Hutchins, our Director of Threat Intelligence for CryptoSogic Vantage Breach Monitoring Platform, notified me of our team's active monitoring of the developing situation. On this date at approximately 10 a.m. Eastern Time, while investigating the code of WannaCry, we identified what looked like an anti-detection mechanism, which tested for the existence of certain random-looking domain name. Our team proceeded to register the domain associated to this mechanism and directed it to one of our sinkholes, controlled by and hosted on the CryptoSogic network infrastructure. We then noticed and confirmed that the propagation of the WannaCry attack had come to a standstill because of what we refer to as a kill switch having been activated by our domain registration efforts. While our efforts effectively stopped the attack and prevented WannaCry from continuing to deploy its ransom component, we knew by then that the attack had already propagated freely for many hours at minimum. Based on the velocity of the attack estimated by sampling data we collected from our infrastructure, currently blocking the attack, we believe that anywhere between one to two million systems may have been affected in the hours prior to activating the kill switch, contrary to widely reported and more conservative estimates of 200,000 systems. One month after registering the kill switch domain, we have mitigated over 60 million infection attempts. Approximately seven million of those are in the United States. And we estimate that these could have impacted at minimum 10 to 15 million unique systems. I will note that the largest attack we, th we thwarted and measured to date from WannaCry was not on May 12th or May 13th when the attack started, but began suddenly on June 8th and 9th on a well-funded hospital on the east coast of the United States. It is very likely the health system is still unaware of the event. We measured approximately 275,000 thwarted inf infection attempts within a two-day period. Another hospital was also hit on May 30th in, in another part of the country. A high school in the Midwest was just hit at the beginning of June 9th. Presumably, every system at this location would have had its data held hostage if not for CryptoSogic kill switch. Moreover, CryptoSogic has been under constant attack by unidentified attackers attempting to knock our systems offline, thus destabling the kill switch and further propagating the attack. The earlier of these attacks came from a well-known Mirai botnet, which took down large portions of the United Kingdom, Germany, and the East Coast, parts of the East Coast of the United States earlier this year. Despite these attempts, our systems remain resilient and we increased counterintelligence measures to mitigate the amplitude of attacks against us. We believe the success of WannaCry illustrates two key facts about our nation's systems. Vulnerabilities exist at virtually every, every level of computer infrastructure, ranging from operating systems to browsers, from media players to internet routers. Exploiting and weaponizing such vulnerabilities has a surprisingly low entry barrier anyone could join in, including rogue teenagers, nation states, and anyone in between. So how do we adapt and overcome and mitigate these threats and weaknesses? While many cybersecurity experts who have come before me offer the usual gloomy, there are no silver bullets, I've had the opportunity to play on both fronts, on offense via penetration testing and red team competitions, and on defense providing protection to global 100 organizations with very high enterprise risks. Our attack responses must be more agile and with higher velocity and intensity. While the nation has considerable literature on risk maturity models and various frameworks, the actual resources for cyber defense are scarce and there are simply is not presently an adequate level of highly skilled, highly experienced, and highly available operators in the cybersecurity field. While there is no shortage of good ideas, which claim to be able to solve the infinite amount of problems and every subsequent idea needs development, support, testing, maintenance, et cetera, all of which we characterize as developer debt. 
Unfortunately, many of these solutions take too long to procure and end up being outdated and essentially useless before the ink dries on the paper it is written on. I am optimistic, however, that there is a successful path and strategy forward. Application and software level mitigations which protect against exploitation techniques used by the hackers have moved the needle to protect against exploitation of the very fabric on which we build our defense assumptions. Mitigations able and incomplete are nonetheless effective and have increased the cost of identifying vulnerabilities in systems and developing programs to exploit them. Other, mit other mitigations include various design approaches like compartmentalization of data, systems, and transmissions. Such mitigations have measurably raised the bar required for mass exploitations in critical communications software like internet browsers, web servers, and other protocols are, which are fundamental to business continuity. Investigating and investing in technology doesn't necessarily guarantee any actual improvement. In fact, one could argue that introducing more technology stacks exacerbates the maintenance debt and creates uh, immediate monetary loss because there are few metrics or analytics to actually measure the effectiveness of any particular technology. This is because we are typically years behind the attacks in terms of the sh sword and shield battle. As these resources ebb and flow, knowledge gaps are also created, and the loss of domain knowledge specialists who cannot immediately fill these gaps and replace them. We also must be less risk averse in terms of the defensive operations we undertake, more open to failure, and ready to adapt and learn from these failures. We need a stronger focus on threat modeling and fire drill simulations that will focus on the events of magnitude which would cause significant damage. A significant response with the WannaCry incident was that there was no real guidance or course of action that was well communicated. The media focused on points contrary to defense who done it. And this incident could have resulted in a complete breakdown of processes had this been an unpatched zero day vulnerability and there was no luxury of a kill switch. The largest success, though incomplete, was the ability for the FBI and the NCSC of the United Kingdom to aggregate and disseminate the information CryptosLogic provided so that affected organizations could respond. Information sharing can be valuable, but our framework can be vastly improved by triaging cybersecurity threats and events of magnitude in a clear and repeatable scale, not too dissimilar to the Richter scale, which measures the energy released in an earthquake. Likewise, a scale that takes the technical and social elements of a threat into account to evaluate its, its destructive power enables first responders, us, to better organize and mobilize and focus on the most area, important areas of risk. While there do exist various scoring systems for evaluating the purely technical element of a threat, they fall short in terms of clear and actionable information outside of information technology. We focus too much on application-specific vulnerabilities with obtruse names like MS17010, and none of these values are effective in quantifying the overall impact potential of a wider global environment. We need an easier to grasp method of prioritizing threats that have a large scale destructive potential in contexts like WannaCry. To this end, once we have determined a method to evaluate the risk with respect to aforementioned technical and contextual specifics, we can, do, we can apply the appropriate mitigations. In conclusion, one of the largest issues is the transitory nature of a crisis. This message still has not resonated of the destructive potential of these attacks and importance of its awareness. We think this can be explained simply by the fact that organizations are too slow to adapt to such a volatile long landscape. There's a vast human resource shortage and little by way of metrics to demonstrate return on investment of defensive technologies. Again, I. I thank the subcommittee for inviting me here to appear today to discuss crypto's logic involvement in the lessons learned for WannaCry, and I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions you may have when they're fielded. Thank you, Mr. Nino. I now recognize uh, Dr. Romine for five minutes to present his testimony. Chairman LaHood and Abraham, Chairman Smith, Ranking Members Beyer and Lipinski, and members of the subcommittees. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss NIST's key roles in cybersecurity and how they relate to recent incidents. In the area of cybersecurity, NIST has worked with federal agencies, industry, and academia since 1972, starting with the development of the data encryption standard when the potential commercial benefit of this technology became clear. NIST's role to research, develop, and deploy information security standards and technology to protect the federal government's information systems against threats to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information and services was recently reaffirmed in the Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2014. 
NIST provides resources to assist organizations in preventing or at least quickly recovering from ransomware attacks with uh, trust that the recovered data are accurate, complete, and free of malware, and that the recovered system is trustworthy and capable. NIST's Guide for Cybersecurity Event Recovery provides guidance to help organizations plan and prepare for recovery from a cyber event and integrate the processes and procedures into their enterprise risk management plans. The guide discusses hypothetical cyber attack scenarios, including one focused on ransomware, and steps taken to recover from the attack. Three years ago, NIST issued the Framework for Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity, or the Framework. The framework, created through tight collaboration between industry and government, consists of voluntary standards, guidelines, and practices to promote the protection of critical infrastructure. In the case of WannaCry and similar ransomware, the framework prompts decisions affecting infection by the ransomware, propagation of the ransomware, and recovery from it. While the framework does not prescribe a baseline of cybersecurity for organizations, for instance, a baseline that would have prevented WannaCry, it does prompt a sequence of interrelated cybersecurity risk management decisions, which should help prevent virus infection and propagation and support expeditious response and recovery activities. On May 11th, President Trump signed Executive Order 13800, strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure that mandated federal agencies to use the framework. Under the executive order, every federal agency or department will need to manage their cybersecurity risk by using the framework and provide a risk management report to the Director of the Office of Management and Budget and to the Secretary of Homeland Security. On May 12th, NIST released a draft interagency report, the Cybersecurity Framework Implementation Guidance for Federal Agencies which provides guidance on how the framework can be used in the United States federal government in conjunction with the current and planned suite of NIST security and privacy risk management standards, guidelines, and practices developed in response to the Federal Information Security Management Act as amended, or FISMA. Another NIST resource that can assist system administrators in protecting against similar future attacks is the most recent release of the NIST National Software Reference Library, or NSRL. The NSRL provides a collection of software from various sources and unique file profiles, which is most often used by law enforcement, government, and industry organizations to review files on a computer by matching the profiles in the system. NIST maintains a repository of all known and publicly reported IT vulnerabilities, such as the one exploited by the WannaCry malware. The repository, called the National Vulnerability Database, or NVD, is an authoritative source of standardized information on security vulnerabilities that NIST updates dozens of times daily. NIST analyzes and provides a common severity metric to each identified security vulnerability. NIST recently initiated a project at our National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, or NCCOE, on data integrity, specifically focused on recovering from cyber attacks. Organizations will be able to use the results of the NCCOE research to recover trusted backups, roll back data to a known good state, alert administrators when there is a change to a critical system, and restore services quickly after a WannaCry-like cyber attack. NIST is extremely proud of its role in establishing and improving the comprehensive set of cybersecurity technical solutions, standards, and guidelines to address cyber threats in general and ransomware in particular. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on NIST's work in cybersecurity and in preventing ransomware attacks. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Romine. I now recognize Mr. Tuhill for five minutes to present his testimony. Good morning, uh, Chairman LaHood. Uh, Turn on your mic, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Chairman LaHood. Chairman uh, Smith, Vice Chairman Abraham, Ranking Member Byer, Ranking Member Lipinski, and members of the committee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear today to discuss cyber risk management. I'm retired Air Force Brigadier General Greg Tuhill. I currently serve on the faculty of Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College, where I instruct on cybersecurity and risk management. Prior to my current appointment, I served as the United States Chief Information Security Officer, and before that, in the United States Department of Homeland Security, where I served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity and Communications. During that period, I also served as the director 
of the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, which is commonly referred to by its acronym, NCIC. During my Air Force career, I served as one of the Air Force's first cyberspace operations officers, and I currently maintain both the Certified Information Systems Security Professional and Certified Information Security Manager Professional certifications. Cybersecurity is a risk management issue. However, many people mistakenly view it solely as a technology concern. Cybersecurity indeed is a multidisciplinary risk management issue and is an essential part of an enterprise risk management program. Now, I recognize we have a very full agenda of topics today and I'm sensitive to your time. I have submitted for the record a written statement and in that statement, I discuss the recent WannaCry attack and my assessment of how future attacks may impact the public and private sectors. In short, I view WannaCry as a slow pitch softball, whereas the next one may be a high and tight fastball coming in. We need to be ready. I also discuss and share recommendations on topics the committee has identified for today's agenda, including the President's recent cybersecurity executive order, public and private sector partnerships, the cybersecurity framework, and proposed legislation. In short, in that, uh, I urge the Congress to uh, continue its great efforts to strengthen our enterprise risk posture. I urge you to authorize and empower the Federal Chief Information Security Officer position, which currently is not an authorized or specified position. I also uh, suggest that instead of calling it the NIST Cyber Security Framework, and I'm a huge fan of this framework, I suggest we start calling it the National Cybersecurity Framework to reinforce the fact that it applies to everyone. And further, NIST did a brilliant job in crowdsourcing the development of this framework, but it was really people from around the country that brought to the table best practices. NIST was the great trail boss for this, but it really is a national cybersecurity framework. And then finally, uh, in, in regards to the uh, proposed uh, H.R. 1224 uh, legislation, I congratulate the committee and the members of the Congress for taking the initiative to really reinforce the need to implement the framework across the federal government. I do suggest, based upon my experience in both the uh, military and the government sectors of the federal government, that we do two things with that act. One is we uh, amend that act to make it apply to national security systems as well. Having served extensively in the military and uh, in the federal government, I believe that the national cybersecurity framework applies equally to national security systems, and I recommend that you make that amendment. Further, I uh, concur with uh, my colleagues who suggest that uh, let's leverage the inspector general and auditing communities that are currently in the uh, different departments and agencies and reinforce their need to conduct appropriate audits using that cybersecurity framework. Again, I thank you for inviting me to discuss cyber risk management with you today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Tuhill. Uh, I now recognize Dr. Thompson for five minutes to present his testimony. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. <clears throat> and Chairman, uh, Chairman LaHood, Vice Chairman Abraham, Chairman Smith, uh, Ranking Member Lipinski, and Ranking Member Beyer. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk about what is a critical subject. Uh, understanding the current threat environment is essential to crafting good policy and effective defenses. And last month's WannaCry ransomware attack is just one of the latest manifestations of the kinds of disruptive attacks that we are now facing. The timeline of WannaCry, I think, has been well covered um, by the other folks on this panel, but I did want to share with you a graphical timeline <clears throat> that hopefully you can see uh, in the monitor. Apologies for the small print. Uh, What's interesting, I think, uh, about that and where I'd like to add some color is to give you Symantec's perspective on the events as they unfolded. And to give you some context, Symantec is the world's largest cybersecurity company uh, with technology protecting over 90% of the Fortune 500 uh, and uh, being used extensively by government agencies around the world. 
In addition, we protect tens of millions of home users through our Norton and LifeLock branded products. The threat telemetry we get from these deployments represents the largest civilian threat intelligence network in the world. WannaCry was unique uh, and dangerous because of how quickly it could spread. It was the first ransomware as a worm that had such a rapid global impact. Once on a system, it propagated autonomously by exploiting a vulnerability in Microsoft Windows. After gaining access to a computer, WannaCry installs the ransomware package. This payload works in the same fashion as most crypto ransomware. It finds and encrypts a range of files and then displays essentially a ransom note to victims demanding payment, this time in Bitcoin. Symantec worked closely with the U.S. government from the first hours of the outbreak. We connected DHS researchers uh, with our experts, provided indicators of compromise and analysis to DHS, and received the same back. And during the outbreak, DHS held twice daily calls with private sector to coordinate operational activities. From our perspective, this was one of the most successful public-private collaborations that we've been involved in. Our analysis of WannaCry revealed that some of the tools and infrastructure it used have strong links to a group referred to as Lazarus by the security community, which the FBI has connected with North Korea. Lazarus was linked to the destructive attacks against Sony Pictures in 2014, and also the theft of approximately $81 million from the Bangladesh Central Bank last year. The links we saw between WannaCry and Lazarus include shared code, the reuse of IP addresses, and similar code obfuscation techniques. As a result, we believe it is highly likely that the Lazarus Group was behind the spread of WannaCry. Beyond WannaCry, the threat landscape continues to evolve very quickly. We're seeing attacks become more sophisticated, not just in technology, but in the social engineering approaches that these attacks use. We're also seeing more attacks being leveraged against IoT devices such as the massive weaponization of IoT devices that we saw with the Mirai botnet last fall. Mirai launched one of the largest distributed denial of service attacks on record and led to significant disruption of major cloud services. The explosive growth of attacks like WannaCry and Mirai, I think underscores the need for preparation and deploying integrated and layered defenses. These attacks also show that response and recovery planning and tools is an essential part of cyber risk management because when good defenses will stop many attacks, we have to be prepared that a determined adversary may get through those initial defenses and we must lay a foundation for recovery. There's no question that WannaCry was an important event, but unfortunately, it will not be the last of its kind. In fact, it's more likely an indicator of what's to come. Good fortune played a significant role in minimizing its impact, particularly in the US, but we will not always have luck on our side, which is why we must learn the lessons of WannaCry and make the necessary improvements to our defenses and response capabilities. This hearing is an important part of that effort, and we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, and thank uh, all the witnesses for your, your testimony. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes, and we'll begin questioning. Um, as I talked about in the beginning, the, the title of this uh, hearing today is Lessons Learned from WannaCry. And uh, we've talked uh, a lot this morning about WannaCry and, and how that played out uh, across the world. But in terms of what we've learned about the genesis and origin of where this came from, I know the Washington Post came out with an article yesterday that the NSA has linked the WannaCry computer worm to North Korea. 
Um, I'm wondering if, uh, Dr. Nino, you can talk a little bit about the genesis and origin of where this came from, particularly because it appears it's from a nation state. And I know there's references to what occurred with Sony Pictures and also with the Bangladesh Bank and, and what we know about it and, and what's being implemented, uh, on, I guess, on the, on the government side to prevent this or hold um, an entity or the government accountable. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think if I understand your question, um, you're asking about, one, the origin and our, our conjecture to that, and number two, um, perhaps, if I understood also correctly, what would be the rules of engagement for something like that if it was another nation state? Um, why it may not be, um, why we, we think it's ambiguous and to conjecture over the origins of WannaCry, there are tales of code in there that suggest one way or another that some nation state could have been responsible. Unfortunately, and as I said in my written testimony, anyone could have created this level of attack and often misdirection is found typically in binaries like these attacks we see. Uh, I would compare it perhaps in an analogy to Photoshopping a program to look a certain way. Um, or it could have simply just been what it is, which is exactly what we see. It's hard to tell, so we, we won't, I, I won't say that I know the origin of the attack, nor should I conjecture on it, but I, what I can say is that these attacks are very difficult to attribute, and CryptosLogic is a cybersecurity company, um, not an intelligence agency, so it'd be very difficult for us to pursue an answer to that. As far as rules of engagement, I also think that the question segues the same way. Um, it would be difficult to create attribution or origin to any of attack, and therefore, rules of engagement would be very difficult for us to give any kind of assessment on. Dr. Thompson. Uh, this, this was truly an interesting attack. We spent a lot of time in our research labs looking at both the code that was used in WannaCry, but also where WannaCry communicated out to. And there were very, very close similarities to other kinds of attacks that we've seen, specifically attacks that we attribute to a group called Lazarus. And these attacks, this malware, the reuse of strings in that malware, the reuse of command and control infrastructure out on the internet by that malware, led our researchers to believe that this is strongly linked to the Lazarus group. Now, similar to, uh, to my colleague on the end, uh, we're, we're not the intelligence community either, and <clears throat> I agree with those comments that attribution is often difficult, but what we've seen leads us to believe that it was a part of this Lazarus group, and separately, the FBI has linked the Lazarus group with North Korea, and I think, uh, Chairman LaHood, the article that you're referring to from yesterday uh, is another potential evidence point on that as well from the NSA. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nino, um, we, we talked about the kill switch and, and how that stopped uh, the attack, but we also referenced the fact that uh, last week a hospital on the East Coast and a high school were subject to attack. C can you explain how, um, if the kill switch was implemented correctly, how the hackers uh, responsible for WannaCry were able to continue to perpetuate the attack despite uh, the registration of the kill switch? Absolutely. Uh, although I'd like to be a doctor, it's Mr. Nino. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, it, you have to understand the material makeup of the actual uh, malware and how it works. Why WannaCry was so significant is that it's self-propagating. That's what gives it the title, a worm, if you will. Uh, meaning the actors don't need to even be in existence. And sometimes we refer to these things as zombies, zombie botnets, because they continue to proliferate regardless of uh, the actors that, or parents or creators of the particular attack. In the case of the examples I gave in the testimony regarding the health system, which there are many, that was just a, let's say, a corner case that was very significant. The worm continues to propagate because it is scanning and seeking to expand itself, and that portion of the worm is not subject to the kill switch. So its expansion and spreading, which uh, in, in an effect, is still exploiting systems worldwide. What is not 
triggering is the payload, if you will, the ransom component. And that component, therefore, doesn't trigger most of these organizations worldwide right now don't know they're getting actively exploited still. But it's because they don't see the ransom portion of it. So that's why we have 60 million attacks thwarted to date, if not more. And so just nobody knows it's still happening. And that's why I said it was, I don't think the message has resonated, given those figures, that this is still needs to be patched. And this, this, this again, points to the point of resources. Thank you, Mr. Nino. I'm out of time. I will yield to uh, the ranking member, Mr. Beyer. Thank you, Chairman Hood, very much. And uh, I'm just so impressed by our panel today. There's so much information here. And, and congratulate Dr. Romine and Dr. Thompson for being PhD mathematicians. Uh, that's wonderful. We actually, Jerry McInerney was here just a little while ago, a member of Congress, who's our, I believe, our only mathematician in Congress. But, um, and Mr. Nino, congratulations on winning the hacking tournament. I never had a chance to say that before, but that's very cool. And uh, General Tuhill, it's very cool that you're now, after all the, th the things you've done in your life, combat and diplomacy and first CISO, to be up there at Carnegie Mellon with their buggy races around Shenley Park. Is a, every university has something that makes it cooler than every place else. So. Uh, and General, I want to start with you. The, you talked in, in, in your long written testimony, but H.R. 1224, co-sponsored by a bipartisan bill here, but we have expressed a lot of concern about the audit function that NIST would be asked to take on. And I was particularly fascinated by the, your points, which we didn't raise when we had the hearing here, that it would make it much more difficult for NIST to be reviewed as an honest broker, that um, this would change their perceptions about their current and future roles, that have a chilling effect on many of the relationships that NIST has within government and industry, that a lot of these relationships are, quote unquote, learning relationships based on a common quest to identify and incorporate best practices. And this would change those relationships not in a good way. It might inhibit or stifle the free exchange of information from public and private entities to NIST. Can you expand on that at all? Uh, this seems to be a yes, pretty sir. powerful argument against that audit function. Yes, sir. You know, frankly, I'm a, a fan of the intent of the legislation. Section uh, 20A uh, in uh, making sure that folks are, in fact, using the cybersecurity framework across the federal government, I think is brilliant. We need to follow through on that big time. And frankly, it was something I was promoting while I was the United States Chief Information Security Officer. And uh, as a matter of fact, in my last federal uh, Chief Information Security Officer Council meeting, in uh, January of this year, uh, I proposed and we had a unanimous vote amongst the council to do a risk assessment uh, for the federal government based on the framework. So that portion of the legislation I'm uh, wholly supportive of. Section 20B, the proposal to do the auditing and compliance activities, I'm also a fan of. I think it's important that we do auditing and compliance. However, I do stand by uh, what I wrote in the written testimony that I think that NIST is not uh, the best place to put that. It doesn't have the culture, it doesn't have the mission, it doesn't have the personnel uh, to do it as effectively as the existing Inspector General and auditing functions. And from a practical standpoint, NIST is a great organization that I've been working with for the last 35 plus uh, years. And the relationships that NIST has is, in fact, as a neutral party that is on the quest to choreograph efforts to find the best ways of doing things. An auditing function or a compliance function, on the other hand, is looking to see if you are, in fact, following the checklist. I think that uh, if we want to have an auditing and compliance function, which I definitely think that we should be doing, we should be giving direction to those folks that, jo whose job it is to do that auditing and compliance function. And uh, frankly, this is an operational issue. And inspector generals have always been, in my book, the folks that do performance uh, inspections that are the ones that are going to help those commanders in the field in the military as well as the executives in the federal government do their job better and have better uh, visibility into their risk posture. I believe we need to have the inspector generals and auditing functions that are currently in place be the ones who execute the intent of the uh, committee and the Congress. Right. Thank you, General, very much. Uh, Mr. Nino, um, based on your testimony, you should be a doctor. It's filled with really interesting things. 
And your third three-part conclusion that the largest issues were A, that organizations are too slow to adapt, B, that we have a vast human resource shortage, and C, there were little by way of metrics to demonstrate return on investment. And you talk about um, creating a, a, a method to prioritize threats, something like the Richter scale, magnitude in a clear and repeatable scale. Who should put this together? Who should manage it? Who should maintain it? How do we make this happen? I, I think it would be interesting to see NIST participation in something of this, where it's basically crowdsourced through various academics and commercial and private uh, entities that could look together and see how they're prioritizing risks and threats, and then see if that could be in some way put into some sort of simulation system that allows to be scalable, where people as a resource is not scalable, um, technology can be, and that would be an effective area. Uh, I also see that the commercial sector alone can, can produce that as well, and that could be adopted, but I think that any time you have some sort of regulatory mandate, it's taken much more seriously. And what I mean by that is, for instance, if we had an event of magnitude that was measured, and if we put an arbitrary number on WannaCry, let's say it was a 7.5 magnitude by some arbitrary figure, shouldn't that particular event be required to be fixed by organizations, whereas right now it's mostly voluntarily. So if, if a water system or a power grid doesn't fix it even after WannaCry post, shouldn't we see that sort of mandate where we can know that that is regulated because that event of magnitude has context versus you can't boil the ocean when it comes to patching vulnerabilities. We're not gonna win that war, it's infinite. But we should be able to win the war of at least the attacks we know about. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Byer. I now recognize uh, Chairman Abraham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, also stand in awe of the brain cell power on our panel. Uh, we could probably use a couple of you guys as mathematicians when we work through our budget process. So, and Dr. Thompson, if, if indeed North Korea has a role in this virus exploitation, I find it ironic that a country as North Korea that not only suppresses but quashes religious freedom would use a biblical name, Lazarus, as its code name. So just an aside, Dr. Romain, my question is to you. When news of WannaCry started spreading, what, if any, steps did NIST take to ensure federal agencies' information systems were protected, and was NIST involved in any government meeting that took place around that time? Uh, thank you very much for the question. The, the response for an event like WannaCry, from the NIST perspective, the primary goal as a scientific institution and as an institution that provides guidance is to learn as much as we can about the incident and about the, uh, the or not the origin from a country point of view, but the, the technical origins, uh, and to determine whether the guidance that we issue is uh, sufficiently robust to help organizations prevent this kind of attack. Um, I'm not aware of specific meetings that we were involved in that were discussing the operational side of, uh, of the WannaCry. I think the uh, uh, you know, law enforcement and intelligence communities were certainly meeting. Uh, you, you heard reference to uh, DHS being uh, quite active in helping the private sector to, uh, to deal with this uh, issue. Uh, from our perspective, it's more learning whether we can improve the guidance that we make available to, uh, to entities to try to not only prevent these attacks, but also recover for, from them and uh, to be prepared for them uh, in the future. Okay, and I'll stay with you for my second question. In your testimony, which I did read, you said that uh, NIST recommendations and the NIST guide uh, for the cybersecurity event recovery and cybersecurity framework <laughs> would sufficiently address the WannaCry incidents. Will the requirement in the cyber executive order to agencies to implement the framework help them be better prepared in the future to defend against these types of incidences? And will this be enough, or should more be done? It's, uh, thanks for the question. It's, it's difficult to know whether it will be enough uh, for the next event. Um, but I can say this, one of the important things that emerged in our uh, discussions with the private sector during the development of the, uh, of the framework was the 
we are often thinking about uh, detection and prevention of uh, attacks. Sometimes we don't pay enough attention to response and recovery. And so one of the things that the framework does is to spell out the, the five functions of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And we're providing a lot of guidance now with the incident response uh, guidance that we, we've provided, for example, um, to, to help uh, uh, different organizations be better prepared to respond and recover. I mean, one of the, one of the analogies that I've drawn recently is, you know, the, the Boy and Girl Scouts are right. Uh, their motto is be prepared. And the fact is, the better prepared an organization is through its risk management uh, uh, activities, which we think the risk management framework uh, from FISMA coupled with, uh, for, for federal agencies, and under the umbrella of the cybersecurity framework now, uh, we think those are the tools that are necessary to, uh, to implement the kind of preparedness that's that's, uh, that organizations should have. All right, one quick follow-up. Uh, what specific steps in lieu of this one across should NIST take to help federal and state agencies uh, be better prepared, as well as the private sector? So we're already looking at, at uh, the, some of the consequences associated with this, um, some of the incident response work that we have, uh, uh, some of the data integrity work that I talked about earlier. We launched the data integrity uh, project at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, um, which has a very strong tie-in with ransomware type attacks. Uh, we launched that actually before the WannaCry came out, but in light of this uh, new event, we're accelerating the, uh, the work that's going on in the NCCOE, uh, so we hope to be able to provide very practical uh, guidance or practical examples of how to be prepared uh, so that organizations can, can see how it's done. Okay, uh, thank you, and General, thank you for your service to the country. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Chairman Abraham. I now recognize uh, uh, Ranking Member uh, Lipinski uh, for his questioning. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony and for all the work that, uh, that you do. Uh, we are, I think, finally beginning to take cybersecurity more seriously uh, here in Washington, although there's much more that I think we need to do. Uh, part of the problem is uh, understanding what, is, what this really means and the impact that it can have. Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, the American public knows the, the significance of uh, cybersecurity and, and what could, could happen. We know when we're dealing with cybersecurity that technology is just part of the solution. Uh, what often matters more, as we saw with WannaCry, is uh, personal behavior and organizational behavior. Individuals and information systems managers must regularly install security patches and phase out outdated software. Organizations must prioritize cybersecurity and have plans in place for a quick response when there are attacks. These are social science issues. Another social science angle is understanding criminal and terror networks as well as foreign state actors and using that understanding to help inform our intelligence gathering and our cyber defenses. So I'd like to hear from uh, each, of, uh, each, each of our witnesses your, your thoughts on whether we are investing enough in the human factors of cybersecurity and what more can be done, what more would you like to, to see us do uh, to, uh, so that we are, are taking care of these, these issues. Sorry, Mr. Nino. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Uh, I, I think it's a great point that you bring up. Um, there are other issues other than technology at play. Uh, cybersecurity is hard. It really is. Um, software is hard. Security is hard. When you put them together, it's very hard. Um, one thing that we know will be quite difficult is resources. Resources will maintain their uh, need for quite some time, and technology is rapidly evolving. We have eroding boundaries. Systems are changing. Uh, we have digital transformation that continuously happens, so we have to relearn our resources and people. This makes it very difficult for those responsible in those areas to manage risk to actually keep up with the actual threat, the pragmatic threat, not just the way we measure our own threats, but in reality, like WannaCry. In that case, I think that we could see a huge value if we were to see investments in things that allow for threat prioritization. 
again, going back to the events of magnitude example, you can't boil the ocean, but you can look at the areas that can hurt you the most and the people that will hurt you the most. And investigating those things and putting them together allows you to start to formulate a picture that allows you to prioritize threats. Once you prioritize threats, the investments you make in those people and those resources will be maximized and will have a better chance of being more resilient. Thank you. Dr. Robin. I'd like to describe two uh, important NIST programs that directly address the human uh, part of this problem. Uh, one is uh, NIST is privileged to host the Program Office for the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, or NICE, which is an interagency program that's dedicated to uh, uh, building a, a larger cybersecurity workforce. Uh, and we've made great strides in that area. I'm very proud of the work that we've done there. The second part of the program is uh, you're absolutely right that one of the key components in achieving true security is understanding how humans interact with technology. Uh, you can be theoretically secure uh, through technology, but uh, if the people that are trying to get their jobs done are, uh, are focused on that and not uh, uh, taking advantage of or in some cases even circumventing security that's in place in order to get their jobs done, you have to know about that and you have to understand how to build systems that have the human in, uh, in the loop. Uh, NIST views uh, a systems level approach for cybersecurity, but we think people, the users, are part of the system. And so we have an active research program in understanding. We have psychologists, sociologists, human factors, engineers on our staff whose entire mission is to understand how people interact with technology so that we can uh, do better in areas like security and usability. To you, General to Hill. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, when I was at, uh, uh, still in public service, I, uh, as a U.S. Uh, Chief Information Security Officer, I plotted out five strategic lines of effort. One was harden the workforce. Two, treat information as an asset. Three, do the right things the right way and at the right time. Four, make sure that you're continuously innovating and investing wisely. And then five, make sure that you're making risk management decisions at the right level. The first one was harden the workforce. If you gave me an extra dollar in cybersecurity, I was going to spend it on people. And frankly, your people are your greatest resource, but they're also your weakest link. We see it time and time again. And 95% of the incidents my US CERT or ICS, the Industrial Control System CERTs, responded to, you could track back to a human failure. Failure to patch, failure to configure correctly, failure to read the instruction book. So I think hardening the workforce should be a strategic priority, and it was one of my top ones. If you know, actually, it was the top one. Further, you know, if you ask for where else could we invest well, exercises. People should not necessarily be confronting crisis without having practiced ahead of time. And uh, my friend Admiral uh, Thad Allen likes to say, the time to exchange business cards is not in time of crisis. We should be doing exercises more often than we are, and we should be investing more in the, into them. And then further, everybody needs to play. Too often we see senior executives who go dismiss that off to the younger folks and the kids in the server room to play. It's a risk issue, and risk decisions are made at the board level. So I think we need to invest in exercises. We already are doing a lot. During the time I was at DHS, when I first got there, the year before, we had done 44. By the time I left, two years later, we were up to 270 exercises. But I think more is to be done, and I encourage uh, the committee and the Congress to help reward these type of practices because I think it'll buy down our risk. Thank you. And if the chairman will indulge me, let, let Mr. Uh, Dr. Thompson go. All right. Thank you. Well, th thanks for that question because I think what you're hitting on is probably one of the most important and underinvested areas in cybersecurity in general. This, this human element cannot be separated from the technology. Uh, often in the security community, we talk about advanced persistent threats. And most people, when they think about that, think about very sophisticated code, malware. But in fact, what we're seeing is the root of many of these advanced persistent threats is the initial way a company got infected or a person got infected was that an individual made, in retrospect, a bad choice. They clicked on a link, they downloaded a file, and we're seeing attackers becoming more socially sophisticated in the way they attack. 
We're seeing them personalize attacks, looking for information on social networking sites, for example, so that they can create credibility in an email or a text message that they may send you so that you're convinced that this is a reasonable thing to go and do. And I think from a, an industry perspective, it is a place that we desperately need focus. I want to give you one, one data point that I think may be useful. So I've had the pleasure to serve as the program committee chairman for RSA conference for the past 10 years. Uh, that conference had 40,000 people, security professionals, that showed up last year, which is a sign of how important I think this industry has become. And three years ago, we started a track called The Human Element, and it has become one of the most popular tracks for cybersecurity professionals because I think we all realize, and I, I love the comments that the general made about this topic, I think we all realize that is one of the most critical areas that we need to focus on going forward human element of the people that are responsible for cybersecurity, but also the human element of users. And I'll make a final comment here. Uh, it is very easy for a user to understand that there's an increase in utility. I know it's easier to get in my house if I leave the door unlocked. Right? Very easy. I don't have to carry any keys around. If I make it more secure, generally, people's viewpoint is you make it more secure, you make it more painful. There are more things that you have to do. So they can easily measure utility, but they can't easily measure risk. And we need to do a better job at helping the individual, the citizen, recognize risk. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lipinski. And now I recognize uh, Congressman Higgins uh, for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Nuno, congratulations on shutting down WannaCry. That was a big mistake by whoever designed that, uh, that worm, was it not, to leave the, the domain unregistered? It's hard to say what it is. Um, could have been intentional, could have been non-intentional. We think it was non-intentional, but it's hard to say. But it definitely was a mistake in, in any regard. Well, congratulations on discovering it. What would WannaCry had done to the world had, had that uh, kill switch not been I, I, can, I can only give a thumbnail of what that might look like, but given today, uh, you know, we're seeing millions of thwarted attacks per day, you also have to realize that the velocity of the attack of WannaCry had slowed significantly as a result of the kill switch. So generally, mathematicians will say these are exponential attacks, things like that. This could have been a very, very massive attack. Most systems were affected. Most uh, cyber experts agree that... Uh it appears that North Korea was behind WannaCry. Do you agree? I think that there are tales in the software program that you could use to associate it, but I do believe that intelligence is cumulative beyond cyber. Cyber is very difficult to attribute. You need other areas to attribute a particular What's your opinion? Attack. Was North Korea behind WannaCry? I don't really want to comment. I've seen other people make very good conjectures about it being China. I've seen other conjectures as if just being uh, random people, but I, I don't think it's worth commenting because I, I'm just not a subject domain expert in intelligence. Intelligent and safe answer, sir. Um, when security software is designed, how easy is it to, for the designer to build a, a backdoor access that would be virtually undetectable uh, we, within that cyber security software? We, we've seen that a multitude of times, and there's very good studies from, from a variety of areas. It, the level of entry to do that is very low. Thank you for, for concluding that. Uh, Brigadier General, my question is to you, sir, and thank you for your service. Um, are you familiar with Kaspersky Labs out of Moscow? I am familiar with Kaspersky Manufacturer Labs. of cybersecurity products, of a long list of cybersecurity products that uh, top intelligence officials at the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, others, advise this body that they don't trust Kaspersky, that they would not use their product on their personal devices. However, it's, it's still used widely across the United States uh, government, various departments. Can you explain that to this committee? Well, sir, I don't know what kind of conversation, uh, you know, my colleagues from those agencies had with this committee. 
Um, however, as, uh, as I go and I take a look at the different products that are in the market today, uh, I believe that the American products are the best ones out there. And just on a value proposition, I buy American. I concur. <laughs> yeah, that's a Brigadier General speaking right there. That's an American speaking, sir. Let me, let me say that, that uh, although there's no public evidence of, of collusion between Kaspersky Labs and the Russian government, it's, uh, it, it's not a large leap. And Eugene Kaspersky has uh, suggested that his, his products have no ties to, to the Russian government. However, it's part of the national conversation, Mr. Chairman, uh, that, and it's widely known that the Russians have been involved in efforts to influence governments ac across the world with cyber attack. And Mr. Kaspersky has suggested that he would testify before this body. I strongly suggest that we take him up on his offer. I'd sure like to talk to him regarding uh, the kill switch in South in North Korea. That having been a rather glaring error on the part of the designer of that that worm cyber attack. Uh, Mr. Nino, what do you think happened to that guy in North Korea? <laughs> it was a kill switch, wasn't it? So, so this uh, message is to, it, should it get to any of the cyber attack, cyber experts in North Korea, if you can get out of the country, you're welcome in the West. We'd love to have you before this committee. We'll give you some real good food. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Higgins. I now yield to Congresswoman Esty. Thank you very much. This has been very enlightening and extremely helpful. There are a couple of points I want to return to and maybe drill down on. One is on the human element, which I think is unbelievably important um, because you can buy all the great equipment in the world. And as you said, Dr. Thompson, if you leave the door open, it doesn't do you any good. And, and I think a little bit about the analogy in hospitals about getting people used to washing their hands. And it may be low tech, but it works. And so one of the things I need think we need to emphasize for all Americans is hygiene, is just what are proper hygiene practices. So that's one, and getting people's thoughts and how we make that absolutely standard operating procedure for all organizations, government and non-government. Number two, we have an issue in the federal government in particular, and all levels of government of really old systems. So we look at the fact that this was exploiting a vulnerability in Windows. Who's still using those systems? Overwhelmingly, I can tell you it's local and state governments that don't have any money and they're still using these old systems. So that's that's makes it an even greater issue. Uh, Mr. Nemo, your point about um, threat assessment and, and understanding levels of assessment, we need triage help. You know, we need triage help to recognize is this what defcon level is this because you know everybody gets those notes in their phones and we're looking at our phones like I don't have time to upgrade my system and and that's the reality of human behavior so I'd suggest a couple of things we ought to be getting behavioral economists and social media experts to your point dr. dr. Thompson and I think that needs to be part of what the federal government part of what NIST is doing is to stay ahead of the game we need to do that um, a number of us were at an Aspen briefing a couple of months ago in, with some of the folks from the top levels of the private sector talking about how so much of our emphasis at the federal government has been, and frankly the incentives, have been for us to be on attack mode. We're developing our attack cyber capability out of the federal government. We've left it to the private sector to do defense. Obviously we need to be new, doing more defense. So that's, you know, how do we incentivize defense attention? It's less sexy, but frankly, a lot more important. So what can we do as a culture change? Where does that have to come out of? Is that out of NIST? Is that out of DOD, NSA, to put the incentives there? How do we make sure we're getting the broader sector of talent pool? Again, it may not strike people bringing in, you know, people who do Snapchat for figuring out 
how do we make sure people don't click on that link, but it, it strikes me over and over again, if we don't do that, if we look at what happened in the hacking on the electoral system in last year, what happened, it was John Podesta's email. It was someone who clicked on a link, and, and it is gonna be the weakest link and the strongest link at the same time. So anyone who has thoughts on that whole bunch of stuff I just dumped, that's what happens when you're at the end of the hearing. You know, you're batting clean up and wanna raise a number of issues. But again, thank you very much. I look forward to following up with all of you, and thank you for your efforts and in joining with us and figuring out how we can do better for America. Thanks. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'll just, I'll just make two very quick points. One is uh, we have active research going on now uh, under the program that I just talked about to understand human behavior, uh, trying to understand uh, susceptibility to phishing attacks uh, and sort of what are, the, uh, what are the things that factor into people uh, not recognizing that something is a phishing attack. And so there's, there's uh, research coming out about that. Uh, with regard to culture change, I think maybe it's underappreciated sometimes the culture change that's going on in boardrooms and, and uh, uh, among CEOs who, uh, in, in light of the framework uh, as a catalyst, I think, for this, but I think this might have uh, been on their radar anyway, but the framework is a means of catalyzing the understanding on the part of boardrooms and CEOs that managing risk to reputation and financial risk and uh, and business operational risk and all of the other risks that you're already managing as a CEO, you now have the tools uh, that you can use to uh, incorporate cybersecurity risk into that entire uh, risk management. I'd, I'd like to pile on uh, to that. Uh, first of all, on the cyber hygiene, we all need to do better. And uh, you know, we've worked very closely with uh, NIST uh, to help promote the national uh, cyber education programs that we have, and I think we really need to do better on that. As a matter of fact, I propose that we, we probably need a woodsy owl, Smokey the Bear type of thing. Uh, you know, I, I called it bite. Let's get the kids out there fully educated and bring that pipeline up. Uh, and we've been working with uh, NIST and across the interagency to do that. And we also need to incentivize. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily be seen as a government that's uh, here to help, but not really help, but to uh, over-regulate. We need to encourage and incentivize folks to do the right thing, to buy down their enterprise risk. But we also have to recognize that risk is an intrinsic part of any management of any business. And we have to be very careful that we don't uh, hamshackle the different uh, boards and C-suites from actually managing their risk. And we need to give them the tools and the support to be good wingmen uh, to help them make those risk decisions. And then finally, you know, we've had a, a lot of discussions publicly uh, in, in this town over the last two, three, four years about the roles and missions as to who does what in helping uh, folks. As for me, having served in uniform for over 30 years and then having uh, done some public service on top of that, I think it really takes teamwork and I view the uh, DOD and NSA and the intelligence community's mission to help us with deterrence and interdiction. Let's stop them and take the fight to the, to the bad guys out in the foreign shores. But when it comes to protecting hometown America, I believe that that's more appropriate for DHS and the work that's being currently done in the NKIC to choreograph uh, different activities across the federal government and better serving the citizens. Yeah. Just a, just a quick comment. Uh, first, I, I support the, the general suggestion that we resurrect Smokey the Bear. I think it would be great to, great to see him again and maybe kind of repurpose him for this effort. Uh, but I, I, I will say first, Congresswoman, thank you so much for, for your comments. I very much agree uh, with what you said about this human element. I can tell you that the, the practice of security, I think, is, is changing very much because of that. And I think about the folks that we hire at Symantec as an example. The kinds of folks that are hunting down the malicious networks today uh, aren't just the computer scientists and, and mathematicians, but they're computational linguists, they're behavioral psychologists, they're anthropologists. They're people that are looking at the human behavior of an attacker group. So that, that, that's one side. On the consumer side, which we, we sell to with Norton, we spend an amazing amount of time thinking about 
how do we make security similar to the iPad? And I, 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 I call it the iPad because it's the only piece of technology I think I've ever given to my mom. And I, I didn't have to give her any instruction about how to use it. She just understood it. And we spend a, a massive amount of time now, today, on design. How do we make it intuitive? How do we make it easier to be more secure than less secure? And I think that is where a lot of effort must go in in the security community today. How do we make it easier to be more secure than less secure? Thank you, Congresswoman Este. Uh, I was just thinking, as you referenced Smokey the Bear, maybe a new company, Smokey the Bear Malware. Would be something you can. We'll register the domain, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Palmer for his questions. Mr. Nino, first, accept our thanks for uh, the quick thinking that allowed the kill switch to prevent so many infections. But, uh, but with regard to your measurements, however, you s suggest that the number of 200,000 infections is too low and, and that before the implementation of the kill switch, there may have been one to two million infections. In that regard, how do you then explain that practically no one uh, tried to pay the ransom if there were that many more? I think there were some who tried to pay the ransom, uh, be it the measure of success of that is hard to determine. I think well, we also... What, what, what you've got is that from many studies that a large portion of the companies do pay the ransoms when their computers are encrypted, but by monitoring the, the Bitcoin while it's advertised in the WannaCry malware, it seems that less than 500 people did so. That's, that's two one-hundredths of one percent. Sure. Well, I uh, think... That's very inconsistent yeah, with, I, I with, think your, with what you're, you're saying. I think that when you look at... It's hard to associate the payments to the actual spread, and I'll, I'll tell you for a variety of reasons. One, when you look at the actual attack and the magnitude of the attack, and then you try to trace it to the payment, if you look at the mechanisms to make the payment, it was one, not clear whether you would get your systems back anyways. And at this point, the attacks have been abandoned. So we know that if you paid the ransom, you didn't go anywhere. Most of the media and many of the experts were suggesting not to pay the attack. We were asked the same question, and we said, you would, you would have to base your own risk organization and determine if you should pay the attack. However, what I can say is the data that we are receiving is absolute. When we get this data, we've been doing this. It's not just WannaCry. We've been doing this for close to a decade. We see and visibly analyze data that comes in. It is accurate. I'd like to um, address this question to General Tuhill. And again, as many of our members have said, thank you for your service, sir. Your testimony refers to people who were infected by running Windows 95, but the published industry reports are saying that almost everyone that was infected was running Windows 7. So isn't it true that the main reason people were infected was because an intelligence community vulnerability was leaked to the public? Turn on your mic, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Sir, thanks for the question. You know, just for uh, clarity's sake, the, um, in, in my written testimony, I highlighted uh, Windows 95 as being used as an exemplar. However, there was plenty of other different operating systems that uh, were very susceptible to this type of attack, including Windows ME, 7, you know, a lot of uh, unpatched systems. But I'm asking about an intelligence community vulnerability that was leaked to the public. I think that if we take a look at it from that standpoint, yeah, I'm very, uh, I, I'm very concerned about that. And I think that this highlights a couple of things. First of all, um, patch your systems. We've been telling you all along to uh, do that. Second of all, I think that as we take a look at um, you know, the leakage of information or the attribution of leakage of information, that's very serious and unacceptable. Well, in regard to the patch, um the reality is that a team of actors calling themselves uh, shadow brokers published an NSA um, exploit called Eternal Blue on the Internet, and that happened in January 2017, and Microsoft released a, a patch that addressed that vulnerability three months later in March. Uh, the patch was called MS-17-010, so it was not a problem of machines being out of date. The problem was that, that if you hadn't put all of the Microsoft-recommended patches on, all of the machines within 60 days, you would become a victim. And it was a, a zero-day attack. 
uh, because when Eternal Blue Code was released in January, there was no way to protect a computer from it. I don't know if I'd rec I don't believe I would uh, characterize this one necessarily as a uh, full zero day uh, attack. I, uh, from my perch, you know, frankly, because the fact that we had some patches that had been put out, and Microsoft went through extraordinary measures, by the way, to go out and create those patches uh, for operating systems that had previously been declared unsupportable many years before. Uh, and I used Windows 95 in my written testimony as an exemplar because Windows 95 had been online for about 19 years before it was retired. Mm -hmm. And for the last uh, three years, Microsoft had not been supporting it. And then for them to come back and put out that patch in March was extraordinary. And f uh, through a federal uh, government and other organizations around the world, we went out and we clearly communicated. And uh, Carnegie Mellon's uh, CSERT was one of them clearly communicated uh, to all of the communities of interest, patch your systems. This is an important patch. And it right. was labeled as a critical patch, sir. If I may, I have one more question for Mr. Thompson. Could you address the double pul pulsar feature that you mentioned? Since no one was actually paying the ransom, is it possible that the real goal of the attack was to allow rem remote access to the machines that the double pulsar was installed on by becoming infected? Uh, thanks for your question. It's, it's difficult to anticipate what the true intention was uh, of this attack, whether it was ransomware, whether it was a, a test, whether it was the ability to propagate some kind of backdoor. Uh, but what is, I think, interesting as a characteristic of the attack, which I think goes back to your first question of why didn't we see, quote, normal or expected rates of, of ransomware payment, the back-end infrastructure that was set up uh, was very weak compared to the typical piece of ransomware uh, that we see out there in the wild. And it is, uh, it is pretty incredible. Many of these ransomware attacks have a very robust infrastructure behind them. They have almost the equivalent of customer support for people that have been infected with the ransomware. We didn't see that level of sophistication here in the back end. I thank the witnesses for their answers. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Now yield uh, to Congressman Webster for his questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this uh, meeting, and a joint meeting, and thank you, each of you, for coming. But I'll tell you, my mind has been on something else, and the, the statements that were given here were similar to that in that they fit. Um, there was an attack yesterday, and I thought about how the fact that it was an advanced persistent threat. And not only that, was it a, um, a uh, personalized attack? And there's some people, there's in fact my seatmate here, who acted heroically to uh, turn it around. And so I just, that's what was on my mind. Uh, these uh, Capitol Police who serve us, who protected life yesterday, along with the heroic acts of many of the members of this Congress. Um, maybe it's a different kind of threat, but it was real. And in this particular case, there was no human error. And so I just, uh, I wanted to take this time that I have, just a few minutes, and, and say thank you for our um, people who work here and for the members who serve here who prove there still are heroes in our country, and they just haven't been exposed yet. And there were some yesterday that were exposed. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Uh, thank you. I think we have a couple more questions. We're going to go uh, just for a short second round here. I'll yield myself five minutes. Um, uh, Dr. Romine, um, you note in your, your written testimony that the National Vulnerability Database, NVD, uh, that NIST maintains and, quote, updates dozens of times daily, unquote, of all known and publicly reported IT vulnerabilities documented that vulnerability that the WannaCry malware uh, exploited. A, a recent report notes that 75 percent of the vulnerabilities documented last year were disclosed elsewhere first and that it takes on average seven days between the discovery of a vulnerability and its reporting on the NVD. Uh, what is the reason for the delay there, uh, if you could talk about that, and is NIST working to get rid of that lag time? Thank you for the question. 
we're always interested in trying to shorten uh, time to deliver really important information to our stakeholders. Uh, in the case of NVD, uh, our goal is not first to disclose or first to, uh, uh, to uh, disseminate, uh, the, the, although we want to do it as early as we can. Our real goal is uh, accurate curation, including an assessment of the impact uh, that a vulnerability might have. And that assessment requires a certain amount of analysis that has to be done before we can, uh, before we can include something in the, in the National Vulnerability Database. Uh, the other reason for that is that the disclosures are often uh, from sources that are not uh, necessarily reliable from our perspective. And including uh, information about vulnerabilities from sources that we're not uh, that we don't view as authoritative uh, would would not be in our best interest for the NVD, I don't think. And uh, was there a delay in reporting the vulnerability that the WannaCry malware exploited? Uh, I, I don't know the exact duration between the time that we received the report and the time that we put it in the NVD. Uh, I'm sure it was a matter of days. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. I yield to Mr. Beyer. Uh, thank you, Chairman, very much. Uh, General, you are, you are the first Chief Information Security Office, and you took that position, I guess, last September under the Obama administration? Yes, sir. Um, do you believe the federal government should have this federal CISO position? And um, I know the Trump administration hasn't filled it yet, but uh, do you, any reason why you left at the time that you did, and any concerns about whether it will be refilled? Well, first of all, thank you for the question. I, I believe that this is a best practice uh, to have a chief information security officer in different organizations. Uh, the first chief information security officer position was created in the private sector over 20 years ago. And it took about 20 years for the federal government to create one. I think it is critically important to, uh, as part of an enterprise risk management approach that you do in fact have someone who is focused on information security and the risk to the enterprise, and advising uh, the corporate community, as it were, up, down, and across as far as what those risks are and best practices to buy down and manage that risk. Within the federal government, we still don't have an authorization for a federal chief information security officer in statute. It was, uh, my position was appointed as an administrative uh, appointment, and I think that as we take a look at uh, as we move forward. And the executive order that just recently came out uh, is a great step forward. I think we need to firm up and uh, make sure that this position is an enduring position, but we also need to authorize and empower the position such that that chief information security officer can, in fact, have the authorities to choreograph and direct activities that are nece necessary to better manage our risk. As far as the appointment goes, I look forward to seeing who the administration brings forward, and I will coach and uh, serve as a wingman for that person. Great. While we're talking executive orders, you made the really interesting case that we overclassify, that the default position right now is to make everything the highest thing, and that we should instead make the default position the lower level of classification and argue our way up. How do we operationalize that? Is this executive order, legislation, memorandum of understanding? Thank you for that question. I'm very passionate, passionate about it because I was uh, in, responsible for public and private sector partnerships while I was at DHS and the information sharing uh, between the public sector and the private sector. And frankly, we overclassify too much time-sensitive information in the federal government, in my view. And I believe that the solution set is going to have to be a combination of legislation as well as executive action. So I think that really both branches of government are going to need to partner up as far uh, to determine the best means of getting information out faster to folks in, so that we can take timely and actionable actions in this fast-paced cyber environment. Great. Thank you. Mr. Nino, you, you had one uh, very intriguing, or many intriguing lines in your testimony. One said that uh, was, quote, points contrary to defense, parens, who did it? Um, and what I understood from that is we spend too much time trying to figure out who is Lazarus or who is Bayrob or rather than trying to, to defend ourselves. Can, can you expand on that? Because I confess, as a naturally curious person who watches Law and Order and CSI and all this stuff, I want to know who did it. Um, I, I think that the 
barrier of entry at this point is that anyone could do it. So conjecturing over who has done it is a very difficult task because cybersecurity is something that could be easily misdirected. Um, you, you never really know who the attack is. And focusing on that doesn't solve the problem that we're vulnerable. We are vulnerable. So if you leave the door open, there could be thousands of people that walk by your house every day. Um, would it really matter if it's because you've leave, you leave yourself exposed that who, who has done it? They do it because they can, and we should not make it that way. We should make it so that we are resilient and we are a very strong nation in regards to defense. Great. Thank you. Dr. Thompson, do you want to pile on at all? I do. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you, you, you know, I, it, it's interesting. We don't spend very much time looking at who did it as in who is the country behind it, who is the enterprise behind it, who is the person behind it. But it's very critical for us to associate patterns of behavior. So if we associate attack A with attack B and then believe that these two things are connected, it will let us learn more about that group, the tactics that they use, and make us better prepared to protect against a new attack sight unseen. And that was the case with Symantec's AV engines and our artificial intelligence engines because of previous training on this against the WannaCry malware. So it's critical for us to have that grouping together. And then we'll leave it up to the intelligence community to decide uh, who that group actually belongs to. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Klimpinski, you have any follow-up questions? No, I think I took plenty of time on my first round. So <laughs> I, that, I think that counts. Just thank the witnesses for uh, your testimony, all the work, as you, as uh, as I said. And we'll sure we'll be continuing this uh, discussion. So thank you. Um, I, in closing, I want to thank uh, all of the witnesses here today for your important, insightful, and impactful testimony here today. And as uh, our two subcommittees look at uh, legislation and public policy as it relates to cybersecurity and the ancillary issues of national security, economic vulnerabilities, privacy, uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you uh, on those issues and appreciate uh, you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. And uh, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional written comments and written questions from members. And uh, at this time, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, yeah, that's, that's good, great. Uh, yeah, that's very, very good. Much. Yeah, good subject matter. Yeah, really good stuff. Yep. Uh, not easy. Sarah's scary.